Hello, I'm Mercedes Stevenson, and this is the West Block. Politics, perspectives, and players. Two campaign planes, dual citizenship, plus discussions about racism, homophobia, and abortion. Lots to break down as we head into the federal election on October 21st. Joining me now to discuss it all is our strategy panel. Fred DeLore for the Conservatives, Anne McGrath for the NDP, and Richard Mahoney for the Liberals. Richard, these two stories, at the end of the day, people look at them and they go, you know, it's a bit silly. Two campaign planes, dual citizenship, we're trying to choose who's going to run the country, and this is what we're supposed to pick from. They're both driven, as we said, by campaign war rooms. Why do war rooms do this? Why do they think this kind of politics is effective? War rooms do this because they're trying to throw the other guys off their game. They're trying to disrupt whatever the message that the conservatives are trying to get on, on a broader set of issues to the electorate. The liberals will try and say, you know, let's see if we can't mess up their day. They're trying to tell a story about who these people are and maybe in these kind of sometimes irrelevant things, two planes, whatever, dual citizenship, all of that, you're telling a wider story about that. So for example, the Liberals on the dual citizenship, I don't think any Canadians think that it's wrong to have dual citizenship, but Mr. Scheer himself criticized other leaders, Mr. Mulcair, Mr. Dion, uh, the former governor general, for having that. And so it's, it's, it, they're trying to tell a story, not that he's, it's a bad thing that he's a dual citizen, but rather, is he something that he doesn't, other than what he pretends to be? Is he, is he not as advertised as the, as the thing goes? Is, is that the story? So, but it sometimes, as you say, falls flat because well, people go, what are the big issues? That doesn't matter to me whether the guy's got two planes or one plane or a half a plane. It's, it's a bit of the same thing with the Conservatives and the planes. Okay, there's a second plane. That seems hypocritical when you have a party that's saying we're all about the environment and they are doubling their carbon emissions as they go across the country. But, well, they also bought the carbon offsets. Obviously, campaigns think this is effective, and yet we haven't seen anything moving in the polls. Why not focus on your opponent's weaknesses when it comes to policy instead of this kind of mudslinging? Well, we certainly do. We put a lot of effort into the policies that we're pushing out. Uh, Mr. Shear's uh, announcements uh, every day is making a, roughly is making an announcement. Um, but, but at the end of the day, it's on all of us to uh, to focus on that. But we get caught up into this. Uh, well, and the war rooms are driving it by releasing. Of course, they're yeah, they're, they're pushing it. At the same time, like you know, Mr. Mr. Trudeau is talking about the environment. He's a supposed champion of the environment. He attended a protest on it. But his record shows that you know he doesn't have a plan on the environment. He has no way to reach his targets. And now he's actually flying around with two planes. Uh, it, it exposes the hypocrisy. So it's important at the same time, while we're pushing our message, to also show the contrast and what the other side's actually doing and what they're actually trying to do. So, and it, it is mudslinging, but it does expose hypocrisy on both sides. You look at this story as an ndp -er. Which one, the plane or the dual citizenship, do you think is more damaging? I think they're both damaging. Uh, and I think that to get to the issue of like the mudslinging and how the war rooms are operating and that kind of thing, I think that in an era of increasingly leader-centered uh, campaigns, um, people care about the character of the leader. And so this speaks to character, whether it's hypocrisy or even this idea of a double standard, right? That, you know, even in both of these stories, I would venture that many Canadians don't, don't even know what a carbon offset is. It's inside lingo. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. it, you know, it's kind of meaningless. I would bet many Canadians would never even think of having dual citizenship. It's not, th these are not, you know, you're kind of appealing to a group of voters who don't have your experience. Uh, in life and who see you as increasingly elite and out of touch. And I think as an NDPer, that's what I look at when I see this. I see the elitism, being out of touch, uh, not being focused on the issues that matter to Canadians. So I would prefer, and I hear from voters uh, as well, like whether it's in focus groups or at the doorsteps or whatever. And for me, I would have preferred if the big story this week had been about how we uh, step up and meet our obligations to First Nations children instead of having, you know, the Trudeau government basically d deciding that they're going to challenge a court ruling that found them in violation of uh, uh, the rights of Indigenous children. And when it comes to the dual citizenship, do you think that people really question somebody's loyalty if they hold dual citizenship? Is this a real issue for somebody who wants to run the country? I don't think it's a big issue for a lot of people. I, I, I think that the issue of hypocrisy and double standards is really more uh, what this is all about. I think that most Canadians wouldn't have a problem with this. However, and, and one of the things that I've thought when I've looked at this also is how much did his staff uh, know about this? So with the case of the, you know, the Conservatives went after Mr. Mulcair for having dual citizenship, French and uh, Canadian, and it was quite a quite a big deal. But we all knew that he had French citizenship, and we had talked about how to deal with it, and it was, you know, we were prepared. It looked to me like they were 
uh, the people around Mr. Scheer may have been taken off guard by this. And that gets back to, for instance, the blackface, brownface thing, where I wondered why in the vetting process and in the preparation process, it looked like his staff also were taken off guard by this. Fred, the question for me when he said he made the steps to renounce his citizenship in August was, why didn't he do this when he first became the leader of the Conservative Party, when the Conservatives had the history of attacking other people for the same thing? Right. Look, he uh, he did make the decision to renounce it. I think the, the leader, uh, any leader that's running to be prime minister should have uh, citizenship in just one country, and that being Canada. Uh, I think it's an important symbolic uh, thing for us to have. So um, he did take the steps to renounce it before the campaign began, um, and he won't, he's no longer a U.S. citizen once the paperwork is approved. And he's been very forthcoming with that once he started the, you know, going down that road to, to do this. Uh, and Richard, speaking of the hypocrisy, when we talk about the two planes, why would the Liberals not have just revealed this at the beginning? I mean, you have to think when you're flying two campaigns, you know the other war room is watching planes potentially. This could come out. And if you're out there saying publicly, we're all about the environment and reducing carbon emissions and a carbon tax, but we're flying two planes, that could be a problem for you. Well, I think from their perspective, they did this last time. This wasn't, they didn't sort of think it was a secret, number one. Number two, the attack on the two planes is the sort of same thing that a lot of right wing tropes have been doing for years. They used to, go at Al Gore because he had a big house, all that sort of stuff. The thing that I think is, is strange to me is, I mean, you can, Mr. K Trudeau's running a pretty good campaign. There are great visuals. There's a reason for that because they've done all these things. They've done all this homework. The, the, the thing that's important to me is the Conservatives aren't even trying to make climate change an issue in the campaign. Mr. Scheer didn't show up at any of the climate protests. He basically has a plan that says they do nothing. And even his attack on this thing shows they don't want, they want Canadians to think this is someone who won't even, doesn't give a crap about, uh, uh, about, about, about climate change. One of the other big issues in the campaign has been abortion that people have talked about. And for the first time this week, Fred, we heard Andrew Scheer come out and say he personally does not agree with abortion, but he doesn't change the law. Why didn't he just come out and say this earlier? Because a lot of people were willing to say, perhaps you can have a different opinion personally than you do policy-wise publicly, but it took him until this point in the campaign, and it's been damaging. Well, look, Mr. Scheer, uh, I think we've all known that he's been pro-life. Uh, that's always been his position. Um, and he's also been very clear, as all Conservative and Liberal governments have been, that we're not touching this. Uh, it's not an issue we're touching. Mr. Trudeau said he was pro-life uh, a number of years ago as well. Um, but no government is, is opening this issue. Tomorrow, right. it's the first English leaders debate. It's a lot of people on this stage and a lot of moderators. And some people are wondering, how do you break through all of that and come out on top? And what's the strategy for the parties going in to make their points and make their leaders stand out? I think that what's important for the leaders is they have to be calm, they have to be present, they have to be well rested, they have to know the files, they have, and they have to know the particular points that they need to make in order to differentiate themselves from the other leaders. So for a leader like Jagmeet, Singh, what's important there is that, he, that that we don't allow the Liberals and the Conservatives, Mr. Scheer and Mr. Trudeau, to try and turn this into a two-person race and to acknowledge that there is there are other options. Yeah, Fred, in the Quebec debate, Mr. Scheer seemed to be surrounded. He was taking it on all sides. What's the Conservative strategy heading into this debate? Well, there's no question he was the target, and I'm sure he'll be the target again Monday. Uh, his message is going to be to Canadians about how his platform is to make life more affordable. And the other uh, leaders, uh, I I think understand that that message is resonating and they need to go after him. Final word to you, Richard. Um, conservatives have made a habit of underestimating Mr. Trudeau and his abilities. The one thing I would say is, I pick up on Anne said, these debates don't usually have a knockout punch. One debate on a campaign that I chaired uh, several years ago, I remember, all the pundits said at the end of the debate, well, she clearly won the debate. Uh, this is, uh, you know, on points and so forth. And then literally in the aftermath after the debate, when people had tuned in, we saw hunks of our support fall off. It's because people decided essentially what Anne said. They didn't like what they were seeing. They found it too harsh. They thought she interrupted too much. They thought the, you know, a, 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 the whole package of what they saw, they just since they didn't like. Was it a knockout punch? No. Was it the turning point in the election campaign? Absolutely. And this may be the turning point in what has been a largely deadlocked election campaign, but that's all the time we have for today. So I'm going to wrap it up and we'll see all of you next week. We'll see if we're still in the same position. That's all the time we have for today. Thanks for joining us. For the West Block, I'm Mercedes Stevenson.